I'm Robin Martinelli. This is Beyond Evidence. Now part two of trains, planes, and automobiles. I think it's really good that you're talking about the fact that you can have two things going on at the same time because the everyday person, that's not our world. You know, we don't think Mm -hmm. about when something happens in our lives that it could be criminal as well as civil. Yeah. And so you have these two cases going on for the same incident, kind of, to, and that evidence crosses over, right, for both cases. So that, that is just really interesting. To me, it was second nature. Yeah. So yeah, when yeah. you brought it to my attention, you're like, how can you do civil and criminal with, and then mm-hmm. I thought to myself, doesn't everybody know this? Yeah, no. It, you're like, no. Yeah. No. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't know you can do that. Yeah. And, and I sat there and I'm like, I guess th- the world out there kind of doesn't know that you can have one incident and have mm-hmm. all these lawsuits going, depositions going, the criminal actions, everything going at the same time. Yeah. yeah. And it's just second nature for me mm-hmm. because our next case dealing with planes mm-hmm. was this that is crazy. <laughs> oh, gosh. Horrible. I guess this is going to be kind of bizarre, but this was like my pushing into a 1996 plane crash. Of course, I didn't get involved till like 97, 98. Yeah. It made me think to myself, gosh, I've been a private investigator that long. Yeah. Which mm-hmm. is a really, really, I mean, we barely had phones back in 98. Yeah. You know, but with this case, obviously a civil case, I think we were reading there was 100, 100 110. 110 people passed away on an airline Mm -hmm. that you can barely find on Google. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. Very purposeful. Mm -hmm. And it was Value Jet Mm -hmm. Airplane 592 in 1996, taking off from the Miami airport near the Everglades. Yeah. And immediately going down. Yeah. Don't really know if the pilot was I'm sure the pilot perished, I guess. Yeah, so. everybody. Yeah, I think it said that there were 105 souls on board and then the pilot and attendants made mm-hmm. it 110. Yes. Everybody passed. So my job was very very crucial and very disturbing, very emotional. And I'd only been doing like criminal defense work up to this time, DUIs, drug cases. And so my job was to literally sit in a room with the attorneys and look at pictures and film and put like body parts together of what Mm. they filmed, what, Mm -hmm. what matched, like maybe this arm and this foot. And so try to put it together, try to find that person on the roster. Yeah. Evaluate who they are, like, Mm -hmm. were they a doctor and married with three kids and had insurance? Were they married? Were they divorced? Had they been arrested before? Yeah, yeah. So my physical job was to literally get everything I could find. Where were they going? Who would talk to me? So this took hours and days and months. One of the things when you first said putting body parts together, I was thinking, how in the world do you do that? But then later on, you said maybe there were tattoos or there were pieces of clothing or there were boots or whatever, but you were Mm -hmm. identifying from the wreckage, mm-hmm. what pieces went together. And like, then, like a puzzle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's horrific. Thank God that, well, you did it, and then you have people mm-hmm. still to this day that that's what they do. I always wondered about that in a plane crash. How in the world do you... Come up with a figure. Identify? Yeah, I mean, that's... Yeah, mm-hmm. so it's very interesting how... What a horrible introduction, but you did it. Yeah, to, to the civil cases. <laughs> yeah. And um, I took it very, very seriously because yeah. I knew that it wasn't going to be my job to put a figure on that situation, but it was going to be my job to say, okay, this person had this much college. This person was only 16, but this is what they did in high school. Right. This is how long his family lived. Like grandma was 96 and this one family's father died at 55 of heart attack. And Mm -hmm. this one was sick. So it was anything and everything. We didn't have a whole lot of social media back then. It was just, it wasn't traumatizing, but I took it very, very serious to heart about Mm -hmm. every individual. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. it took me a good, I would say, month for one person to get through it of all of them. You would 
estimate, so I guess this is how much the family would get is what you're doing. You're estimating right. I, how much I would, that person's life. Yes, I would give the research, mm -hmm. and it was up to the insurances and up to right, the... To so I, yeah, mm -hmm. so I never like put an actual number. Right. Mine was just how you compare giving money to a 16-year-old yeah. that was on the flight to opposed to a 40-year-old attorney that has three kids, stay-at-home mom, and right. three practices. Mm-hmm. That's kind of how things yeah, very happened. Interesting. Yeah. And I got very close to the attorney. So it, it was it was very gut wrenching. But I, f I took it on as a, a big part mm -hmm. of and, and, and I remember there was just different issues about certain families that you're like, well, you know, I don't know if they get a lot of money. And then all of a sudden you throw in there. Well, they had two children that were it was like a ge genealogy that I had to come up with before all of the DNA stuff wow. was. You know, so it, it was it was very particular. Yeah, so you got to know not not just the person that was that was killed in the accident, but basically like their backgrounds, their history, their life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, day in the life of them. Yeah, and the wow. family. I noticed when we were trying to Google the airline, it's like buried, like yeah, really yeah, yeah. deep, deep, and then yeah. you've got Spirit, and I don't know if Spirit is connected to them, but you have Spirit and and different airlines since then, and mm -hmm. so I knew that that's what they were going to do, fixing to be different branding. That was an introduction, and then obviously you don't have a whole lot of those cases, and I started rolling out with divorces and custody, and yeah, so that was very interesting to me with that. That took a long time. I was still doing criminal defense work and that and newly married and the kids. And so then we come to automobiles. Yes. With automobiles, obviously, you can have vehicle homicide. You can have DUIs, drugs, tractor trailer trucks. Mm. I'll never forget that the case with the big tractor trailer truck, I think five in the morning going to Athens and there was five students, nursing students. Mm. that were yeah. killed by the truck. Yeah. yeah, and I'm thinking it was a Walmart truck, but I literally had to go help because he had stones in there and, and look and see where the stones landed and had they injured and come to find out he had video of misconduct of what he was doing in the truck at the time. Mm. So that was a, a really, so tractor trailer situations are horrendous. Yeah. But the one case I want to talk about is down in Macon, Georgia. It's not been solved. My client is a fiance to the person that was murdered on his bike, his mm. motorcycle. Had his helmet on, wasn't determined he was speeding, and he was just going down the road and all of a sudden a charger but at the time, nobody knew, you know, pulled out. He was instantly killed. The person in the car gets out of the car, looks at him, gets back in the car and leaves. Yeah. But at the time, it was just a hit and run. It's crazy, though. Gets out of the car, looks at the person they just killed. Mm -hmm. Gets back in the car and goes. Right. And and wow. he and, and he when I say he, he died instantly, he passed away, but within minutes or two of like that, who could have said what could have happened if help maybe get his helmet, do something, render right, aid. Right. But my job was to try to find the person that did this. They didn't know the car. So I'm rushing down to Macon and lo and behold, there's these residents with ring cameras. And I never forget that I approached to a business and a resident that they were just about to delete all their film. Wow. And so we finally got to see a film of the accident. And it was a charger, and it was dark in color. And it was a small statured male. And it looked like there was a female in the car, but we couldn't see the tag. We literally pulled just about every, with permission of the investigator, Shannon, he's so great, pull all of the chargers down in Macon, which yeah. was a very thick, thick case. But we narrowed it down to a family. Don't know if they were here purposely or not, but they were Spanish and didn't know exactly where they came from. But we'd looked him up on social media, and like right before that, he had been drinking on social media. We knew exactly who it was, went straight to that house, and there was a, a vehicle in the backyard that looked like a charger, and it had a tarp on it. But by the time the investigator investigated, there was no car. Oh, wow. It was just like, and then there's no no defendant he's gone mm -hmm. to. Right. And his whole family. Very gut-wrenching, hasn't been solved yet. To my knowledge, he hasn't been arrested yet. That happens a lot. Yeah. People leave a lot. Mm -hmm. And as horrific as things are, you should always stay. Yeah, and I just think about 
when we witness accidents, you drive by and you think, well, somebody else is going to report that, that they've seen it or be an eyewitness to it. But you think about the fact that there's something called a bystander effect that people have a tendency to do what everybody else is doing, you know. So if everybody else is leaving, they're leaving too, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it's really crucial for us to think about this, that somebody who has severely injured or caused damage to or killed somebody might be getting away with it because nobody's willing to say, I saw it. Mm -hmm. I saw the accident Mm -hmm. or I got it recorded, whatever it might be. Yeah. Because this is so sad. Her fiance gets killed Mm -hmm. and the person that did it is just going to live the rest of their life free. She has to live the rest of her life without her fiance. She was going to get married in what, like, what like did a you month say? or two, a month, oh a month or two, and he was such a good person to her and helped taking care of her child with special needs. And yeah, you know, there again, you don't know what insurance. Right, right, right. So because who, they're gone. Yeah. So yeah. who can you go after as far as insurance? You had a yeah. death. Oh, you usually so get a terrible. payout. Mm. Okay, but you don't know the insurance. Like. Yeah. You know, like even if you don't find him, you want to try to find the insurance. Well, you don't have a car. Right. Just kind of wishing, can we find that out? You don't even know if it was insured or not. Yeah. And so it it, it was just so horrific. But I do get a lot of hit and runs. A lot. Yeah. And people not. And me and you found out in the office with another recent case that they only hold now because of a law like a year or two that was Mm -hmm. passed agencies, law enforcement agencies now only hold their film Mm -hmm. for 180 days. That's right. Any film. So it could be like our case in Clayton County. Mm -hmm. It could be like, well, that was two years ago, Robin. Like, I'm sorry somebody passed away, but we don't have that film. Yeah. You know, and crucial. So if nobody's requesting open records requests within 180 days of the incident, gone. Unless it's uh, an open case, then Mm -hmm. they have to they have to save it. Right. And if it's evidence, they can never get rid of it because people wait. Right. They wait to file their reports. They wait to go to the police. It's amazing to me that sometimes you have to tell people or the first question you ask them is, did you go to the police? Did you you file a report? Did you call the police? Did you call the police? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That amazes me that people are like, well, no, not yet. No, I didn't do that yet. (laughs) It's like, well, you have to do that. Like yesterday. As we're ending the podcast here, having so much fun, I'm really curious. What helped you say to yourself, you know, this is just, I never knew PIs do this. Yeah. What was your first one or two days trying to absorb what we do? Well, I would say let's give it my first month because (laughs) there's a lot going on, right? I guess some of the first impressions were that I did not realize how closely that you worked with law enforcement and with attorneys. Traveled with you here and there and throughout (laughs) Mm -hmm. to several different counties and even out of the state will Mm -hmm. be going. And Oh, yeah. How well. Lucy's case. Yeah. Lucy's case has got a warrant. Yep. And we're going to get him. Yes. Yes. So Lucy will be able to come back on and say. So awesome. Yes. Yes. Seeing the respect that people have for you in the attorneys, law enforcement, even in like the clerk's offices and stuff, because you've been doing this for a long time. You're well known. You're well respected. I love that. And I didn't really think about previously how a private investigator you're doing of course I had a police department that reported to me for 16 years right so I was used to their reports but in so many cases um, especially white collar crime they don't have the resources to go out and have the six-month investigation which is why a PI coming in and doing the investigation and then working with the police department and saying, okay, here's all the evidence. This is everything that we found. That's incredible to me. Like that opened up a whole new world to me. And I'm just thinking every department should be doing this, should be working with PIs. Like, yeah, (laughs) no, Mm -hmm. no question about it. But that was a a totally new thought to me that how closely you work Mm -hmm. with the police, with the sheriff's department all across the board, attorneys. 
and, and I'm so excited you've joined our team. I hope we can keep you for a pretty long time. And we will be talking about how law enforcement works with us, but also media. Yes, yeah, that's Ho- right. Hopefully we can come back together again. I'm so excited that you came and we could do the podcast. And, and I love this podcast. I just love how Business Radio X and Tom Sheldon, executive producer, just helps and gets us all lined up and gets us done and helps other people. It's just so great to have a podcast. I encourage anybody out there to contact Mr. Sheldon about their business and get out there. And because, you know, we're in traffic hours. Yeah, you know? that's right. Yeah. It's like, what, what are we going to listen to? What, I mean, there's so many 80s that we can listen to or 90s. It's yeah, just yeah. in our heads. It's like, okay, can that's we good. listen to some talk? And, yeah. you know, so people are listening to it. And it's there kind of forever for mm-hmm. like a legacy for like my granddaughter. And, mm-hmm. you know, for her to listen when she's 16 and go, hey, that was my Gigi. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that's what she was doing. Kind of yeah. like Nancy Drew. So I encourage anybody to please, please, please look into podcasts with Mr. Tom Sheldon and look into doing a good podcast for your company. So thank you, Linda, for coming. We might just make this a a thing we get together all the time for a podcast to get your opinion on a new case. Mm -hmm. How are you looking at it and fresh and new? And thank you so much. So much. This was fun. Thanks for having me. Please contact us by our website, martinelliinvestigations.com. Martinelli ends in an I. Investigation starts with an I, so that's two I's with an S on the end. Our email is M-I-I and then Georgia spelled out, G-E-O-R-G-I-A-P-I at gmail.com. And please call us anytime at 770-337-3999, 770-337-3999 for a free consultation. Thanks so much and have a great peachy day.